Hockey Inside Out, presented to you by the Montreal Gazette. Welcome to the Hockey Inside Out Show. I'm Montreal Gazette Sports Editor Stu Cowan, joined by regulars Chris Nyland and Jack Todd. And a special guest this week, we have John Bartlett, the voice of the Canadians, formerly with TSN Radio and now with Sportsnet. Uh, that wasn't a pretty game against Buffalo the other night, John. Uh, are certain games tougher to call than others when you're <laughs> getting awake up there in the booth? Yeah, some, sometimes they can be. But, you know, that was one of those games, I think, that was a dangerous trap game for the Canadians with Buffalo. And, and right now, Canadians fans are shaking their heads going, how did you lose to the Sabres? Well, now you know how Bruins fans have felt all those years <laughs> when the Canadians always foiled them, right? <laughs> that's, right. It's, that's exactly what it is. It's that one team that's got their number. You can't yeah. figure out why, but the Sabres do right now. And uh, it was a game that I I thought Buffalo may come out and give the Canadians a tough time, and they did. So kudos to the Sabres for ending their 14-game losing streak. If there's one thing I think it showed, Chris, it showed, you know, Carey Price being talked about a Hart Trophy candidate. He had a little bit of a slow first period, and they couldn't rebound from it. Well, I wouldn't give him... Uh, he had one goal he maybe should have had back, but come on, when you have three guys below the goal line on the first one, Lazella coming in late, leaving a guy wide open in front of the net, they just weren't ready to play. They didn't play well down below the dots in the first period, and it cost them. They, they left Carey Price exposed. Mm -hmm. I know uh, Bodog came out with odds this week. Uh, the Habs are 12 to one to win the Stanley Cup. Jack, the only teams ahead of them are Anaheim at six to one, Chicago six to one, and St. Louis nine to one. I don't know if I'm taking that bet. I don't know. Like <laughs> last week, TSN was telling us that Winnipeg was the third best team in the league uh, before they fell apart. I, you know, I, I definitely don't buy that. There are too many weaknesses. You know, you, you miss that big guy up front, the, the, the third defensive pair. There are holes. Carey Price, I don't think he can win 16 games by himself. It's sort of like Groundhog Day, John. I mean, there's slow starts after slow starts every game. What can Terry do? Or what, how do you... Yeah, the slow starts are a bit of concern for sure because you don't come out of the gate with that jump that you want. And, and last uh, game against Buffalo would have been a situation you would have thought they would have come out with a little jump and, and get that early lead. I think the biggest concern for the Canadians, though, and, and Jack talks a bit about it when you talk about the holes in the lineup right now, it's the secondary scoring. And, and the game against the Sabres, as good as Jonas Enroth was, that's a game you need to have guys like Lars Eller putting the puck in the net. Uh, Jorge Sakac hasn't scored uh, in, in a while. And all the goals have, have lately have come from Pacioretty, Galchenyuk, and a few from Subban at the line. And that's the problem right now. And, and I think if the Canadians are going to move forward and want to have a good playoff run, you've got to have scoring from those other lines. And you need secondary scoring, and they're not getting that right now, and that's the concern. And when you look at the lineup, too, and this is no respect to Dale, or no disrespect to Dale Weiss, I think he's been a great player and does a lot of good things. But to me, the Canadians' strongest lineup is when they had a fourth line of Brandon Prust, Manny Malhotra, and Dale Weiss, because that was a very deadly fourth line. They could skate, they could hit, and cause some traffic in the opposing zone. Since Baranto's been out hurt and they've rotated a few other youngsters in, you haven't had that line. We up on the top line. It's, it's not the same. You haven't had the scoring punch. So whatever it is, the Canadians need to figure it out. If they have that kind of a fourth line going again, it means the top three lines are producing offensively, and that's where they're going to get uh, the help that they need right now. Do you put some of this on the coach, Chris? Has Michel Therrien maybe plateaued put as coach? All on the coach. <laughs> <laughs> Hang him. Get him out of town. No, you, you know, but p part of it's personnel, and... You know, uh, again, you look at last night in the third period, how many times they shot the puck over the net or missed the net. They had an opportunity to tie the game, but that's what happens when you're playing from behind. More pressure, gripping the stick, PK over the net, Placanic over the net, Lazella all alone. He hit the organist, I think. <laughs> 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 it's, not, it's unbelievable. But, yeah, you know, part of it's systematic, uh, systematically and... and the players, again, they they seem not to be ready first periods, like we said. I wouldn't think you'd see that happen in the playoffs. They're lucky they have a cushion right now, and they're going to be in the playoffs. I, honestly, I don't think we'll see that problem in the playoffs. If I hope not. They need to get Eller going. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, if they don't get him going pretty soon, I'm ready to call go to you back and fire him again. <laughs> 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 well, let, let me throw this out to you guys as a curiosity, because the Canadians, obviously, Mark Bergman is going to look to upgrade somewhere. Probably on the right wing, if you look at the lineup, that's the most likely spot they'd want to shop for something. So you're going to have to give up something. 
you think Lars Eller at all is trade bait for the Canadians? Or are they still, because you've got a little bit of a log jam down the middle. It's going to be tough to move Dearnay, and I don't think you want to. You've got Galchenyuk. Eventually, you're going to want back at center, and you go up and down that center ice position. Is Lars Eller a potential trade yeah, bait? Yeah, well, you look at him. He, he's one guy who looks like he has a high ceiling. You know, he, when, when Eller plays well, he plays so well. He looks like he could be a star, and then he just vanishes for a third of a season or something. But I'm sure there's some GM out there who's going to say, we can turn him around, you know, he'll be a number one or two centerman for us. Bergeron Maybe. may want to get rid of that contract with Eller, too. He could. And again, Lazella, there's one thing. He works hard, right? He tries. I know that. But I, I think his vision, his hockey sense, he's not good with the puck. He makes bad decisions. And, and there's times you see him and, oh, my God, that's the guy we want. But you, it, it's few and far between. So, yeah, he could be trade bait. Um, uh, His wife they, says they he can't dance. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I certainly agree with John about the secondary scoring too. Like uh, the, the Habs need it. Like when, when you're just getting consistency uh, from Pacioretty, Galchenyuk, and Subban of late. Uh, he's right. They, the goal's got to come from somewhere else, and that's a, a lot of pressure on Max to score goals when you don't you don't get them from anywhere else. I guess if there was one bright spot about the Buffalo game, you ought to feel a little happy for Brian Gianta. That's got to be the highlight of his season this year, coming in and beating. Yeah, I, I think it was, and he'll probably describe the goal he scored as a top-shelf <laughs> rocket on a breakaway or something. Uh, he was joking about that afterwards. But no, you know, obviously, for the Sabres, that was an important win last night. And uh, not just for Brian Giante, I think for Josh George's as well. That was his return to Montreal, and no doubt all the players knew it in the room. And uh, I, I think they wanted to have a, a big night for both of them because it would be a special night and a bit of a, you know, emotional night at the same time. Uh, the last time Josh George has played as a visitor at the Bell Center was January 2006 when he was with the San Jose wow. Sharks mm -hmm. as a youngster. Yeah, so um, I think it was a very special night for him. And, and that's a win that Buffalo can take. And apparently, by the way, they came from Vancouver early to have their rookie party dinner in Montreal. <laughs> so if you're the Sabres right now, are you saying, hey, coach, I think we should go into every city two days <laughs> yeah, early have and have a rookie party. Rookie party. <laughs> Shea Perry, go baby. <laughs> does it every time. Shea Perry. We'll be right back after a short break. Welcome back. The Sabres got the win against the Canadians. Josh Georges, however, was minus one, is now the minus 28, the worst plus minus in the league. I know on your radio show, Chris, you were talking about was Emelin or Georges, who would be a better fit right now with the Canadians? Well, I, I still go with Emelin. I, and we say right now he's not playing well. There's no question about it. But uh, we know how he can play. And I, I truly believe that Alexi Emelin in a playoff series against Boston is just so valuable, just for the mere fact that he always locks horns with Milan Lucic. And believe me, if he wasn't in there in that series, it's a whole, it's a whole different series for Boston. Uh, I think they perk up a little bit. So, and not that Josh Georges can't do that job, but he, he wouldn't have the same effect as Alec, Alexi Yemelin. A bit of a rough debut for Jacob De La Rose, his first game in the NHL as a 19-year-old, minus two. He only had 12 minutes of ice time. Your thoughts watching him from up in the booth? Well, I think it was tough for him in his first NHL game to play like that, uh, but and especially in that kind of a game where I think the, the Canadians themselves are having a little trouble. But you know what? I think he's got a lot of promise. I like his size. I think when he fills out more, he's going to be a bit of a player there. And that, that's okay. I mean, it's his first game. You know, get it under your belt and, and show what you can do. And I think uh, he's progressed very well in Hamilton this year, especially since the World Juniors. They like where he's going. So um, I, I thought, yeah, a bit of a tough first period, but the whole team had the tough first period. He's getting adjusted. I do like what I see from him, though, and I think there's good potential there, especially with the size. Well, well you I know, like that he tied for the team lead in hits, uh, Mr. Cherry. Please note a sweep. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's nice that they called up someone that's uh, taller than 5'9". <laughs> <laughs> now, his first game in the NHL, what were your butterflies like your first game? Oh, it's incredible. In Atlanta, um, yeah, I was nervous uh, as all hell. It was a nerve-wracking game. I had like two shifts a period, didn't play a whole lot. It, you know, I, uh, uh, God, I, 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 everything I learned in the American Hockey League and did, I forgot that <laughs> night. I did. And I quickly got it back the next night in Philadelphia and had my first fight in the NHL. And I got an assist, so I, I felt like I was... Uh, going after the scoring race. Now, John, you must have been nervous <laughs> your first game calling a game in the NHL. What was that like for you? 
Uh, I wasn't so much nervous as excited, I think. Uh, I was looking forward to it. It was one of those situations where the excitement built up as the day went on, and then uh, when it finally got to the game, it was like, let's just drop the puck and go. And, and just like a player, it's the same thing. You can have all the build-up you want, but once the puck drops and the game starts, you're doing the same thing. And so I think that was sort of, you know, that, that moment is just kind of like, let's, let's just get the game going, and then everything will feel natural. Now, the game against Buffalo, Jack, they had Dolores, Thomas, and Dumal all in the lineup. Yeah. Hamilton Bulldogs is maybe the, um, the GM showcasing some of what he has on the farm for a potential trade. I, I think uh, I was thinking about that actually during the game last night because I figured there's got to be some reason they're all here. <laughs> <laughs> I sure hope it's not De La Rose that they're showcasing, but uh, yeah, I think so. I, you know, I think it's pretty clear they've got to make some moves. Uh, Bergevin pulled off a brilliant one last year, bringing in Vanek. Everybody forgets Vanek was actually terrific for the balance of the mm -hmm. regular season. Totally went into the tank in the playoffs, but he was part of the reason they finished as high as they did. I expect Bergevin to pull another one out of the hat. Yeah, and don't be surprised if they bring in someone that's on the last year of their contract, too, or something, where you're looking at it going, whoa, this might be a bit of a rental. Vanek was a rental that worked out and didn't cost them that much. I know, it, as Jack said, it didn't work yeah. out in the playoffs, but he was a rental that didn't cost them too much and helped them on that stretch drive to get there. So it wouldn't surprise me if they did something like that. You know what I love about him? He never gives up anything to get what he gets. Well, yeah. You yeah know, that's you look the at thing. Giant, uh, he wants to stick to his plan of building this team moving forward, and he don't yeah. want to give up any of those key assets yeah. to get something short term or maybe oh we'll make a run for the cup this year I think he's thinking more long term term and he's looking real realistically at their opportunity to win the Stanley Cup this year yeah I, I know he'd like to but honestly I, yeah. I, I don't think um, they're gonna be it now is that song you know reunited and it feels so good Max <laughs> Pacioretty and David Dearney back together again in the third period against Buffalo they actually looked Good. I, I was actually sitting there just about to, had my laptop, I was just about to write, if there's one guy who's going to get a goal to get them back in this game, it's going to be DeHarnay. And before I started typing, I look up and he's celebrating the goal. <laughs> I hate like, when that Damn. happens. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, also in the end, Patrick Coletta runs Carey Price, sort of accidentally on purpose. Um, is it a concern, Chris, that they're not, the Canadians are protecting Carey Price? Well, you or? know, you're in a position there, you're losing a game, you want to win it, and honestly, guys... I, I think they're scared to take a penalty in that, that situation. Where I wouldn't have been. <laughs> I was just asking my next penalty, question. But it's true. Well, like, I, I wouldn't have been. I would have done it and, and deal with it later. You know, if the coach wants to give me crap for that, fine. Uh, I'm sure the goalie would have given me a hug. The way they were playing, I mean, come on. Uh, they shouldn't have been in the position they were in. They were. I would have liked to have seen someone do something. Now, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just because a little similar to the way Kreider went into Price too. Oh, yeah. Right? yeah, it was, was that accidentally and, on purpose, and right? Acts, yeah, and then you yeah. go and you start to wonder: Are you are you going in because you fell? Are you going because you tripped? Or that wasn't you, an accident. Yeah, yeah. You, are you making a good effort to get out of the way? And maybe not. Now you mentioned Kreider, the game against the Rangers there last week. He sort of challenged PK. PK didn't drop the gloves. A mistake on PK's part, Jive? Or, or? Oh, I don't think so. He can't be in the in the box for five minutes. You know, in a tight game like that, where and as, as important as he is to that team, it's too bad he's a strong guy. He can't fight much. Maybe he should spend some time uh, taking well, lessons I, with this I guy. I think he did the uh, right thing. It's stupid to fight a guy with a mask on to begin with. I just yeah, think yeah. that's uh, foolish. I, I wish the NHL allowed guys to take their helmets off and fight. If they, if they allow fighting, I mean, come on. Uh, it, it's crazy. All, all he would need to do is one punch, and it cuts his hand wide open. And then he's out. So, yeah, it's good he didn't fight him. Playing against a guy like PK would have driven you crazy, I think, when you were there, no? Mm -hmm, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> now, John is the voice of the Canadians. Uh, growing up, were you a Habs fan? Or? Yeah, yeah, I grew up a Habs fan. And, uh, you know, my grandfather had season tickets at the Forum for over 50 years. My first game was at the Forum. And, uh, you know, a, a lot of my uh, great memories of going to games was, was at the Forum and stuff. So, yeah, I grew up a Habs fan. Uh, all my life. So. And the Habs win it. Yeah, not last night, but yeah, sometimes they do. <laughs> Jack, you grew up in Nebraska. You were telling me about your first uh, real-life experience with hockey, your first game. Oh, yeah, it, it was getting to the game late when my girlfriend had tickets, walking in, just getting into our seats, afternoon game against the Blackhawks. Dennis Hall crosses the blue line, takes a pass from his brother, and this slap shot, we're right behind Dryden, about five rows up, and it's just crack, slap. I went, oh man, this is hockey! And like I instantly went from a basketball fan to a hockey fan. One shot. Greatest sport in the world. That's it for this week. We'll be back next week with another Hockey Inside Out show.